Welcome to everyone to our sixth and final session of our series, Catholic Perspectives on Racism and White Supremacy. We're very glad to have Pedro Rios today to speak to us. My name is Jeffrey Burns. I am the director of the Harp Center for Catholic Thought and Culture. And I am a co-sponsor with my, Dr. Michael Lovett Collier and University Ministry. So we, we welcome you. A few instructions. For best viewing, you would want to set your computer to speaker view. Secondly, you will be muted throughout the presentation. If you would like to ask a question, please submit your question through the chat function. You will then be recognized and will be unmuted and you can ask your question directly to Pedro. So now I would like to turn it over to Dr. Michael Lovett Collier. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you all for joining us today. It's wonderful to come back together for another of uh, this series, this important and timely series. So thank you for joining us. It's my great pleasure and honor to introduce our speaker today, Pedro Rios. Pedro is a human rights advocate who has been employed since 2003 by the American Friends Service Committee, where he directs the US-Mexico border program. Pedro is a native San Diegan He's worked on immigrant rights and border issues for more than 25 years. He oversees a program that documents abuses by law enforcement agencies, collaborates with community organizations, advocates for policy change, and works with migrant communities. He's a steering committee member for the Southern Border Communities Coalition and is an ex officio representative for the San Diego Immigrant Right Consortium's Advisory Committee. Pedro holds a master's degree in ethnic studies. And perhaps more importantly for us today, he's a USD alumnus, having graduated in 1995 with a BA in English and a minor in psychology. So Pedro, I so wish we were on campus so that I could say welcome home, welcome back to USD, but we'll take you any way we can get you. The title of Pedro's talk today is Federal Enforcement Parameters That Should Bridge Border Communities with the Movement for Black Lives. Pedro, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Michael, and thank you, Jeff, and everyone else at USD for uh, welcoming me. Um, USD holds a special place in my heart, especially uh, during the mid 90s when I was um, a young man organizing with uh, other folks, uh, essentially against Proposition 187. And, and um, USD was uh, a place where I found uh, a good group of people that supported the work that we were doing back then. And I think um, in some ways kind of pointed me towards a trajectory to continue advocating on behalf of migrants uh, within a, a borderlands or a border framework. Um, so a little bit about myself. Uh, I, I grew up in, here in San Diego and, and uh, pretty much have been here most of my life with a short, uh, time period of seven or eight years that I was living and working in the Bay Area, um, doing very similar work. Uh, when I returned to San Diego, I, I saw uh, a lot of changes. And, and this was uh, during the time after the implementation of, of uh, Operation Gatekeeper in San Diego, which was part of a larger enforcement um, uh, strategy by the Border Patrol that started to change the landscape and brought forth greater uh, aspects of militarization to, um, to our communities. Um, and, and I'll discuss a little bit of that today. And, and, uh, uh, and what I would like to do is um, uh, begin by, I'll show some, uh, some slides uh, to kind of start off the, the presentation and the conversation. I hope that will spark uh, more questions. I do want to recognize that today, October 22nd, is a national day against police brutality. So it's, it's kind of fitting that, that uh, the theme of, of today's discussion kind of falls in with, um, with this uh, day that's recognized primarily by um, families uh, who have had their family members victimized in one way or another by different law enforcement agencies. Um, so uh, what sparked this, uh, the, the idea for for me for this conversation uh, was witnessing uh, the increased presence of Border Patrol and other federal agencies involved in what one would consider to be uh, 
municipal police activity. So, um, and I'll show a picture of this uh, later, but uh, here in San Diego, we saw, for instance, um, um, Border Patrol that were managing traffic at a uh, protest organized by local Black Lives Matters leaders. Um, they were managing traffic going into um, a small uh, shopping complex and together with the Border Patrol. And, and that, to me, raised some questions, primarily because I, I wondered and questioned whether that violated SB 54, the California Values Act, that uh, creates a certain uh, distance in terms of what Border Patrol and immigration authorities can do when they collaborate with uh, federal, uh, with uh, local authorities. But we also saw, for instance, uh, a, a marching of about 400 CBP, that's Customs and Border Protection agents in Washington, DC. Um, we later saw the presence of uh, Border Patrol and other federal agents guarding uh, monuments at federal buildings in Portland, as well as in, in Seattle and in other places around the country. And we also learned that CBP had been um, flying uh, drones uh, around uh, um, areas and cities and regions where uh, Black Lives Matter protests have been taking place. So the question that came up for me was, what, what learnings can we take away um, in terms of the work that we've done along the border? Uh, what, sort, what are the teachings that are available to us uh, when we compare this with the movement for Black Lives? And uh, likewise, what can we learn from um, our um, sisters and brothers in the, involved in the Black Lives Movement that could uh, support and, and augment the work that we do locally um, in border communities. Um, and so I'll try to uh, address uh, these sets of questions as, as I'm going into the, uh, the presentation. Um, and so uh, within that uh, sort of uh, idea or concept, I'd like for you to consider questions as, as we're moving uh, along in, in, in the discussion. Um, so I'll start with the, with the first slide and let me see if I can share my screen here. Trying to see if it's allowing me to uh, share my screen. Do you have that button, Pedro, at the bottom of the Zoom? I do. Uh, let's see. Let me see. I, th I think um, there it goes. Yep. Okay. Uh, okay. You're you're able to see it. Yes. There's kind of like a weird uh, green space in the middle for me. I, I apologize for that. Um, let me just see if that'll. Yeah, it doesn't seem to be working at this point. Hmm. That's okay. I'll, I'll I, I won't uh, share the screen. Um, that's fine. Um, essentially, what the screen had was, um, a, you know, it, it was part of the discussion that I was going to have in terms of uh, making the argument to begin with that there are a lot of uh, commonalities that our communities share. And when, I'm, when I speak of our communities, referencing primarily um, the community that I identify with, which is a border community, uh, primarily here in San Diego, but the uh, border community writ large. So looking at from San Diego, San Diego going all the way to Brownsville, for instance, and uh, similar experiences that, that people have living in the borderlands, uh, together with um, the black community, 
in terms of some of the oppressive nature of, of issues that they have faced uh, over the course of, of, of the history of, of um, enslavement of, uh, uh, of Africans that were brought to this country, for instance. And so uh, beginning, I think it's always important to recognize and, and say the names of people that have been uh, murdered by, by uh, law enforcement officials. I think that's one of the aspects that connects us uh, initially in terms of having that very similar um, parallel experience. So some of the names that come to mind uh, more recently, but also some that have been around for a while might be, for instance, Tamir Rice, um, Breonna Taylor, um, George Floyd, Eric Garner, Michael Brown. You know, these are all names that we recognize and that, and Philando Castile, and that, that really brought uh, forth um, in a much more uh, prominent way some of the problematic natures of um, how policing is done in this country. Similarly, um, the experience that border communities and migrant communities have had um, along board the borderlands, we can also uh, resort to a listing of names of, of people. And so um, here in San Diego, for instance, Anastasio Hernandez Rojas, who was brutally beaten 10 years ago by over a dozen uh, border agents, uh, Monique Tachikin, a mother of five who was shot by a plainclothes uh, border patrol agent. Um, there's the case of Sergio Adrian Hernandez uh, Huereca. He was uh, 15 years old when a border patrol agent shot uh, across the border and uh, killed him uh, in El Paso and, and Ciudad Juarez. So there's uh, a history of, of cases that, that um, we have come to learn about but perhaps uh, oftentimes there's this idea that our communities operate in silos and are experiencing these tragic events without there being a direct connection as to uh, why that's taking place. So if I, if I can take us to the case of Anastasio Hernandez Rojas, also a father of five, uh, he was 42 years old when uh, he was having a difficult time finding work and it was his uh, spouse's uh, birthday and so as he was getting uh, flowers and, and some food, the San Diego police arrested him and uh, turned him over to the border patrol. He was subsequently deported. He spent two weeks in Mexico visiting with family members whom he had not seen in many years. And then he and her brother decided to return to San Diego. And in the process, they were apprehended by border patrol agents. Um, and he was uh, injured in, in the initial uh, uh, apprehension. When he was taken to a border patrol station, uh, there was miscommunication. He was told to dump uh, the bottle water, the, the water bottle that he had. Uh, he misunderstood it because he was told in English. And so instead, he turned over his water bottle and dropped, spilled the, the water that he had in it into a trash bin. That uh, caused a reaction by the border patrol agent who injured him even more. And then the supervisor told that agent to take him to the, uh, to the San Isidro port of entry uh, to uh, repatriate him to Mexico without any due process taking place. At that uh, moment, he was uh, uh, brutally beaten by over a dozen agents uh, and uh, essentially was left uh, brain dead. Uh, by the time he arrived to the hospital, he was also tased, uh, tasered. But in the process, the reason why I bring this case up is uh, we, we remember the um, horrible images of George Floyd, who was um, the officer had his knee on, on George Floyd's neck um, and George Floyd cried out for his, uh, for his mother. Very similarly, if you hear the videotape of Anastasio Hernandez Rojas when he's being beaten, um, he also makes a cry out for his mother. And so there's these, um, these experiences, I think, uh, of, of trauma that um, serve as a basis from which we can um, find some sort of, of, of healing process. For the case involving Anastasio Hernandez Rojas, we just completed a very large scale mural at Chicano Park. It's, um, it's a double uh, column, a double sided mural that tells the story not only of Anastasio and what happened to him, but also uh, depicts images of some of the more recent cases involving children who have died uh, 
under Border Patrol custody. Um, and, uh, and, and it's a reflection and a, a reminder that um, some of the, 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 the abuses that our communities experience, both uh, the black community from local police and the, um, what I would say primarily Mexican, but also uh, Latin American community uh, by uh, border agencies uh, is, is systemic, that, that um, it's not a case of a uh, rotten apple, but there are some real systemic issues that are not that are not being addressed in the way that they should. Um, and so we, if we take a step back um, and we look at the how the police came about, um, there's a quote that I want to read out, uh, which says uh, this is by historia historian uh, Sally uh, Hayden. The history of police work in the South grows out of this early fascination by white patrollers with what African American slaves were doing. Most law enforcement was, by definition white patrolmen watching, catching, or beating black slaves. Um, and so this is in reference, for instance, to um, the, the, um, what we know that the uh, police forces uh, nowadays are an outgrowth of what were slave patrols um, you know, 150 years ago. Uh, and so there's a, a reckoning, a historical reckoning that needs to be made in terms of when we're addressing the reformation of, of police forces, that there is a, a history of oppression that um, uh, needs to be addressed in terms of how they purposefully were, um, uh, were uh, put together to capture people that were seeking freedom. Um, similarly, if you look at the history of uh, Border Patrol, for instance, and, and now CBP, Customs and Border Protection, uh, the, the um, primary um, members of the Border Patrol when it was created in the early 20s were from the Texas Rangers. And the Texas Rangers at that time uh, were known to aggressively target primarily uh, Mexicans who lived along the borderlands. Um, both uh, Texas Rangers, ex or former Texas Rangers, state police, and vigilantes were known for uh, the brutality that they uh, committed against uh, Mexicans that lived in the area. In fact, there was a time period between 1910 and 1920 that was known as La Matanza uh, for the brutality that took place. La Matanza means like the, the killing. Um, the brutality that took place during that 10-year uh, period when there was an increase of migration by uh, Mexicans who were trying to um, escape from some of the uh, some of the violence that was taking place during the Mexican Revolution, but also because of other reasons, economic reasons, family ties that were already in the US and so on and so forth. A quote that I would like to read by historian Monica Munoz Martinez, very similar to the prior quote, reads like this, ethnic Mexicans were criminalized and harshly policed by an intersecting regime of vigilantes, state police, local police, and army soldiers. In fact, um, white supremacy as an ideological framework for brutality in police agencies um, is as much present in the history and the formation of, uh, of border agencies and border enforcement measures. Um, and, and so uh, there is uh, renewed scholarship, for instance, on lynchings of Mexicans that took place. It's, it's not necessarily known as much that uh, it was quite uh, uh, present in terms of how the state um, and the state actors and vigilantes retaliated against Mexicans by uh, lynching them. Um, and, and this was uh, common along uh, the US-Mexico uh, borderlands, primarily in the um, Texas area. And there's a long history there, uh, more so than I can um, refer to about um, even the, the white settlers that were moving into Texas uh, to try to prevent, for instance, uh, Texas from uh, adopting the, um, uh, the anti-slave provisions uh, that Mexico had adopted at that time. Interesting history there in terms of the shared uh, history of oppression, um, similar lived experiences, um, stories of resi resilient survival and uh, perseverance. Um, so if we, if we now jump to the present time, uh, more recently, as I was referring to at the beginning 
that uh, the concern for me was this idea that border agencies, primarily Border Patrol, um, seem to be making a much more um, concerted effort to be present at BLM protests. Uh, we saw that here in San Diego with Chief Patrol Agent Aaron Heitke. He's the Chief Patrol Agent for the Border Patrol for the San Diego sector. Uh, he tweeted out uh, two photographs uh, that showed Border Patrol agents that were heavily armed uh, in, in fatigues and in gears with their uh, rifles uh, that surrounded the uh, altar made for George Floyd. And uh, the tweet said, uh, CBP has received requests to assist other law enforcement entities across the US in the wake of civil unrest. San Diego agents stand ready to assist in protecting our partners from lawless rioting and other criminal activities. And then he shared two photos of Border Patrol's deployment. The other photos shows uh, a large group of agents that are kind of gathered around a parking lot where a lot of their vehicles, it seemed to be a staging ground. Um, and this is uh, in La Mesa. Uh, so we later learned, um, we, we submitted letters to both Border Patrol and to um, the San Diego Sheriff's Department requesting information about what sort of collaboration took place between them. Um, and what we learned is that in fact, the San Diego Sheriff's uh, Department did request assistance of Border Patrol and it was Border Patrol who provided San Diego Sheriff's with a lot of the, the munitions that were used on one of the nights where uh, the San Diego Sheriff's uh, fired uh, rubber projectiles and uh, gas containers on uh, protesters in San Diego, many of whom were involved in peaceful protesting. So the framing then, if we, if we analyze this tweet that was later deleted, that the chief uh, deleted this tweet, but we captured some images of it, where he states that in the wake of civil unrest, um, uh, making it seem as though people who were protesting um, in the name of George Floyd were doing so to cause harm, uh, lawless rioting, as he says, and other criminal activities. And so there's a direct threat of, of um, using then Border Patrol as an agency that, that is known to operate with impunity, where there is uh, very little oversight and um, transparency um, that then gets to patrol the streets in the role of a municip municipal police um, and does so in a way where there is little uh, scrutiny to their activities. Um, and and uh, I'm sorry, I can't show this, these two uh, images, but uh, the two images that, are, that I can see right now are of a border patrol agent standing next to uh, a sheriff's deputy in front of a Home Depot in Santee. This was a BLM protest in June, on June 7th. Uh, the other image that I have on screen, it's, you can just imagine it is um, the flight pattern of a CBP drone that was used in, uh, in many, over the city of Mi Minneapolis, uh, essentially covering, surveilling the protests that were taking place there. Um, in light of that though, I think um, going back to the original question of where, where there might be opportunities for finding a common ground and how we move forward together, um, there also have been an increase um, of uh, migrants who what we would say are black migrants. So uh, people from Haiti, from Cameroon, from other parts of, uh, of Africa who have been making their way through Mexico and arriving at the uh, US-Mexico border. Uh, there's a large number of Cameroonians, for instance, who are detained at the Otaimesa Detention Center. And so um, in recent protests uh, that have taken place at the Otaimesa Detention Center, there's a concerted effort to say, um, when we're calling for the release of, of, um, of migrants, that we also address the increase of brutality against black migrants who are detained at the facility. In fact, what we're finding is that uh, black migrants tend to have a, a different uh, scale. That's probably not the correct uh, phrasing or word for it, uh, but a different system where when they are uh, requesting to be released, it seems that the bail amount for them is um, at, a, at a much higher percentage than would be for anyone else. So there is also this 
disproportionate targeting, uh, discrimination uh, that's taking place, and in particular against uh, Black migrants detained at facil facilities, not only here in San Diego, but this has been detected in other parts of the country as well. So in local protests at the uh, Otay Mesa Detention Center, it's been important, for instance, to um, highlight how uh, that sort of brutality, that sort of uh, discrimination, that sort of oppression even looks different uh, against uh, Black migrants who are detained at detention centers. So um, on our part, what we've attempted to do is support some of the organizations that are Black-led, that are working with Black migrants who are calling and addressing attention to this. So we've had numerous uh, activities that we've done, for instance, uh, meeting, um, we, we called a meeting with uh, Representative uh, Juan Vargas's staff to address this very specific issue. We've addressed the issue of people being detained and how during a pandemic that's even much more problematic and dangerous for people who are detained, but even more so where there are structural uh, barriers that seem to be increased for black migrants. Uh, so the, uh, the work here is to try to address these uh, institutional disparities that are being placed, uh, um, that, that are being placed in, into practice, even in settings that one would think that um, oppression would be sort of uh, equitably applied to everyone who's detained at a detention center. But it seems that even for black migrants that this seems to be um, an even uh, bigger challenge. Um, one of, one of the, um, so other things that we've done, for instance, just, just to finish that thought, not only meeting with congressional representatives, but also holding webinars where uh, these particular um, situations are being addressed uh, much more specifically um, and, and just making sure that there is much more uh, witness uh, to these disparities um, in the work that, that we've been doing. There's an African proverb that um, I like to use in some of the human rights trainings. Um, and it goes something like this, uh, until the lions have their own historians, the history of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. Um, and for me, that, that speaks, um, it, it speaks to how we shape narrative. It speaks to how we acknowledge our, our truths. Um, it speaks to how we recognize our own dignity um, in the struggle for justice. Um, and so some of the um, opportunities uh, I think that we have um, could be, for instance, that uh, how important it is to share our stories and to share our wisdom. So as we are advocating on behalf of uh, whether it be um, uh, police reform or as others have called out for abolishment of some of the institutions, um, how do we ensure that our stories are being told to uh, make the argument of why those are reasonable, reasonable policy changes. As the American Friends Service Committee, we have called for the abolishment of ICE, for instance. And the American Friends Service Committee being a Quaker-based organization with a long history of abolition work, it's not, um, it, it's not a, a far off uh, sort of policy idea that we believe can be attainable, specifically because ICE has only been around for uh, a little over 17 years. Um, an agency which uh, we consistently document cases of mistreatment, of abusive practices, of uh, cases that, that are just horrendous. For instance, the, um, we, in San Diego, we've uh, been able to document cases where parents who are taking their children to school, um, ICE stops them, uh, pointing guns at them, and uh, will take the father or the parent and will leave uh, the child, usually a teenager, but usually uh, miles from the school and miles from the home. Uh, we've documented cases of an ICE raid here in San Diego where they will uh, conduct that raid, place everyone in handcuffs, go through their belongings without any type of search warrant uh, presented to them. I personally, and that was something that I, I witnessed from the outside, and I personally witnessed ICE agents surrounding a home in National City um, and pointing their guns at children that were peeking out of a window trying to see what was taking place. A video from that particular incident also shows how ICE agents uh, went into the home, extracted the, the father uh, who had been in the home for a few hours. Um, and then it was only after that, that they dropped the warrant onto the ground um, 
even though the family had been requesting a warrant in order for them to ensure that they could release uh, their family member to the ICE agents. So there are horrendous cases uh, like these that have taken place around the country. And for us, uh, we, we, we have not yet found a way to reform an agency whose uh, primary mandate seems to be inconsistent with maintaining the humanitarian needs um, and uh, in any way uplifting the dignity of the people who they apprehend. Um, on the other side though, I think uh, going back to that proverb that I mentioned, um, I think it's also important to, um, to discuss how we can uh, support each other's work. And so uh, during the time of the pandemic, there are a number of mutual aid programs that have uh, been started, not only here in San Diego, and, but also around the country. And um, the American Friends Service Committee has been involved in, in some of those aspects. So this is uh, bridging again that work of saying, we're not, we're not providing charity. It's more of how do we build solidarity with our communities and with our, and with our um, neighbors, for instance. Uh, so that's something that's been critical in being able to, to uphold each other and, and, uh, and move away from the practice of charity work, but really moving towards um, uh, building each other's power and recognizing um, the, the worth that each individual has, uh, despite the challenges that they might be living through at that moment. Um, and I think also, uh, deep, debunking the, the idea of silos, which um, I, I referenced at, at some point. The idea that our communities uh, operate only on our own, that we can't uh, go beyond uh, the issue area that we might be working on. Uh, so for instance, because I know that as a human rights advocate that works on immigration issues, on border issues, that I might not have something also to say about police brutality that affects the black community, obviously in a way that is supportive, that's consistent, that um, up, uplifts the work that's already taking place on the ground. Um, and, uh, and this has led us in to have some very deep conversations, uh, particularly with uh, internally within the American Friends Service Committee. We are now engaged in a process of trying to uh, really analyze what it means when we say we want to free them all. Uh, so where that call to free them all was initially a call for freeing people that were detained for civil immigration violations, that has now expanded to mean something much broader, especially um, questioning the, the carceral state that uh, tends to disproportionately impact uh, people of color um, in ways that uh, would be unacceptable uh, in other countries in terms of, of how the US oftentimes might criticize other countries for human rights violations. I think there's a lot of grounding for us to do that work here as well. Um, and then finally, I think, um, you know, defining what our common solutions are. Um, I think it's important for us to have deep conversations as fellow community members, uh, not only with the black community, but also with uh, the indigenous uh, community. And so right now we're looking at how, for instance, border wall um, construction is impacting the Kumeyaay here in San Diego County, the Otom communities uh, in Arizona, uh, the Comecrudo communities in, in South Texas. These are all indigenous communities who are being displaced today by a border wall construction. Um, and it's desecrating their ancestral lands. It's desecrating burial sites. And, and these are uh, real concerns and questions about how we build solidarity in a way that um, dignifies the people who are being impacted um, and ensures that we're able to uphold them and, and, um, and, and be led uh, in a way that, um, that is much more profound because we get to understand each other. And it's not, a, it's not a performative action. It's not just for symbolism, but it's because we are knowing and get, getting to know each other in a much more deeper way. Um, so I think I'll stop there and, and you know, begin with um, the uh, Q&A uh, aspect of it, which I think oftentimes leads to um, uh, richer conversations about what you might be wanting to hear or, or learn more about. Thank you, Pedro. Um, 
thank you very much for sharing your perspectives and your insight and your wisdom. As uh, Jeff said at the beginning, we'll take the questions through chat. So feel free to uh, enter questions you have or, or just even a, a comment you would like Pedro to reflect upon. Please go ahead and put that into chat when you're ready. One thing, Pedro, that did come up already is, could you please repeat that proverb you mentioned, the African proverb about the, the lions and the historians? Yeah, so the, the proverb, and I have it written down here, just wanna make sure I get it, I, I get it right. I, um, so this is a proverb that I, I usually say in, um, in Spanish because it's part of uh, the trainings that we do. I don't have it written down, so let me just, uh, okay, here it is. So the proverb is, until the lions have their own historians, the stories of the greatest hunt will always glorify the hunter. So um, part of that proverb is asking ourselves, who do, we, uh, who do we relate with? Do we relate with the hunters? Do we relate with the lions and, and why? Um, if the lions were to tell the stories of those hunts, what, were, what would their truth look like? How would it reflect the different perspective of the event that took place? And so if we, if we were to hear directly from George Floyd, for, for instance, his story might, might be different from what the story might be of the white officer who had his knee over his neck. Similarly, if we were to hear from Anastasio Hernandez Rojas about what took place in the event that led to his eventual death, it would be different from the story of the Border Patrol agents who quickly put out a, a press statement and uh, tried to frame a narrative that did not include um, a perspective of, of the person that was victimized. And so it's, it's a very um, uh, profound proverb for me because it challenges us to say, we also have a truth to share. And that truth has as much value as the truth that the neighbor might be sharing, the truth that someone else might be sharing, and it needs to be heard. Thank you. Pedro, I wonder if, uh, if you could also reflect a little bit on the reality that with all that's happened in the movement for Black Lives and the death and the murder of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and others, the attention that's the mainstream media has been able to dedicate to the suffering and the atrocities at the border has seemed to decline. And that feels like a real loss and a tragedy in itself. What would you say about that? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, it's kind of interesting because I think immigration is sort of that perennial issue, right? And so we just learned um, a couple of days ago that there are still 545 children that are missing, not missing, that they have not been reunited with their parents. And so the, the court case is happening here in San Diego today. Um, and so it, it's still ever present, uh, but it, it, you know, moves and, and, you know, it comes and goes in, in ways that I think, as you say, gets lost and gets minimized and what's the next sort of topic that we should um, be addressing. Um, but if you talk to um, those people who were victimized because of that policy, you know, they're still suffering, they're still traumatized. And I think um, it, it really um, requires the work of, of people that are um, committed to ensuring that their stories get told and that that doesn't get lost uh, through the cacophony of different sorts of breaking stories that we are learning about on a daily basis. So Michael, I do have a couple of, uh, of uh, questions that were sent to me privately. Should I address those? Sure. Okay, great. So one question is, as an undergraduate student, I was wondering if you could speak to how you were able to start a career around immigration issues. Yeah, and uh, for me, um, as an undergraduate student, I was um, involved in uh, local community organizing. Um, during that time, during the mid 90s, Proposition 187 was sort of the hallmark of the um, anti-immigrant um, movement that really uh, was adopted by uh, many um, elected officials and, and prospective elected officials. So Governor uh, at the time, Pete Wilson, uh, adopted it as part of his campaign and, and uh, it became policy at the national level in terms of the sentiment, the anti-immigrant sentiment and later policy that shifted in, in 1996 that became national policy. So my, um, uh, my involvement was through community grassroots organizing and then I was fortunate to find uh, professional opportunities to uh, continue that involvement and, 
And obviously I continued that involvement in the grassroots setting, but was able to plug in both uh, through my education, through the um, master's degree that I received, but also professionally in, in, in uh, career choices that I made. Um, another question I have here is, let's see, uh, it says we moved uh, for 10 years along uh, the Texas border near McAllen and, Brown and Brownsville and now in San Diego to continue to abuse of human rights is appalling. So that, that's more of a comment. Here is a question. What kind of policies do you think are most important to be implementing in light of the BLM movement and the threat of COVID-19? What aspects of understanding amongst community members is most valued in your human rights work? I think um, we are in a very uh, strange period of time. Um, you know, we're dealing with these elections and the uh, prospect of, of uh, a violent transfer of power or, or a rejection of transfer of power, you know, that's being discussed in many levels. Um, that, that gets further complicated with uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and I think, uh, you know, I'm, I'm certainly not an expert on the uh, disproportionate ways that communities of color um, don't have access to protective equipment or, or don't have access to the same sorts of medical um, opportunities that um, their white counterparts might have access to. So that certainly is something that uh, needs to be addressed, especially. Um, so I'll give you a very uh, clear example of what that might look like here in San Diego. Um, because I do work with a lot of grassroots uh, organizations, there's one that operates in Northern San Diego County. And what they have detected is that there has been an increase in Border Patrol checkpoints uh, north of Fallbrook, um, around the Deleuze area and in Fallbrook itself. Um, the closest hospital for many people would mean that they would have to drive through a checkpoint. And so if you're talking about someone who's undocumented, who might be having COVID-19 symptoms, who is unable to get to the hospital because that means that they'll drive to a checkpoint where they might be questioned. These are station, they, they're not permanent uh, checkpoints. Um, uh, the problem there is how, how much more, uh, you know, the complexities of, of someone seeking access to medical care um, it's much more difficult for someone who's undocumented living in a rural area who then cannot seek that medical care because it means that they might drive through a checkpoint where their status might be questioned, they might be detained, and so on and so forth. And uh, one of my colleagues uh, who regularly will drive through these checkpoints to document them will say that the agents are not wearing masks in many of the cases. And so there's also a concern of, you know, these sorts of uh, uh, spreading of COVID-19 might take place even with the authorities because they are refusing to wear masks. So that's one aspect of changes that I would like to see policy changes is during the pandemic that there's much more consideration should be taken about uh, vulnerable communities that don't have access to medical care or medical care is, is not necessarily as accessible as it might be to others. I would like to see the policies around the border closure changed. There are many people who live in, in Tijuana across to the US to work. I have a colleague that works uh, with uh, SEIU, uh, USWW. Many of their members uh, are uh, work in the um, janitorial industry. Uh, they live in Tijuana because it's cheaper. They cross uh, to the US. And many of them are having problems, especially when um, the US authorities are purposefully slowing down the crossing um, so that people are forced to wait longer and to dissuade them from crossing across. There was a case now about two months ago where an elderly woman died during one of these in while waiting to cross during one of those 10 hour waits. And so these are specific policies that the Trump administration has been using um, the CDC um, as uh, an excuse to close down the border, even though the CDC's own recommendations were to not close down the border in the way that it has been. So there's some very acute and uh, specific uh, policy changes that, that could be made. And I can go on and on about those. Um, um, and then there's a question here about uh, organizations in North County. Um, uh, and you know, I can certainly maybe provide a list at some other point of some of those organizations. Hey Joe, thank you. There's a, a question that came to me. I'll read for you if, if, if that's okay. Sure. Um, 
Pedro, are you advocating that black and brown people and their human rights organizations join together to create solutions? And if so, how would that begin and what would it look like? Yeah, and I think, I think historically it has happened in many different moments in time. And so I, I think that that needs to continue. Um, and, and, um, and, and I think not only uh, black and brown, but also looking at other uh, impacted communities so that, um, uh, so that we're getting to work together um, beyond the idea of a coalition. Oftentimes when we work in coalition, it's because we, we have a, a, a mutual goal that we're trying to achieve. But if we work in alliance, if we work as um, in solidarity with, with each other, really get to know um, what our communities face on a daily basis. And then that way we create the space to develop deeper relationships that are um, beyond just, as I mentioned earlier, performative, um, what we usually talk about in diversity trainings, right? Just, just have a person of color for the sake of having a person of color, but how do we really deepen those relationships to understand uh, what our lived experience is and that we can um, uh, bridge our lived experience. Oftentimes they're, they're already there. And, and as I mentioned, if we look at the history of the slave patrols and the history of uh, how the Border Patrol was created, there's a lot of uh, similar parallels of, of um, repression that our communities have dealt with, trauma that our communities have yet to um, uh, to, to um, heal from um, that could be done in a way that's healthy, that could be done in a way that uplifts our dignity and that could be done respectfully. Thank you. You know, Pedro, um, you spoke uh, during your presentation about the uh, abolishing ICE position that, that AFSC has taken. I wonder, you know, how you would think about the, the call to defund police. And if you see a parallel there, or if, if you would see that differently. Yeah, we are also, so it's kind of interesting because um, we are a part of a group, it's a coalition, national coalition uh, with um, respectable organizations doing policy work in DC that's called the Defund Hate Coalition. And within the Defund Hate Coalition, you have organizations that uh, really believe in, in defunding CBP and ICE and having yet, um, they, they won't adopt the, the, the um, abolish ICE position, which is fine. Um, so in our work, it, you know, it might appear in different ways where we do make the call to abolish ICE, but um, also are working to defund uh, ICE because we see that as part of the, uh, the route that eventually will lead us to abolishing ICE. Um, I think defunding the police uh, as a call is important um, because it, it does, um, I think what it, what it does is it begins to generate conversations about why would someone make that type of, uh, of demand? Um, what is it about the police that um, would make respectable organizations or elected officials say, we wanna defund the police or um, the city council of Seattle to say that we're going to defund our police department or Oregon or wherever, or Portland or wherever it might've been. Um, and I think uh, what it does is that it brings really important conversations that could lead us towards uh, investigating that problematic history that they have and, and perhaps um, lead us towards considering what might be a, a different way uh, of um, ensuring that we're held accountable to ourselves, uh, where they're not rooted in, in uh, colonial um, um, vestiges of controlling people over other people, um, where they're not necessarily rooted in um, prioritizing uh, profits or prioritizing profit or um, a property over people. And so if we look at the idea of private detention centers <clears throat> that are profiting mm -hmm. over, um, you know, their profit is based on human suffering, the fact that people are detained. And so, you know, we, we have to get into a practice of questioning what, what values we want to uphold as a society and what are the principles that will move us towards those values. Um, do we really want to uh, be supporting um, large scale companies that are profiting from this human suffering or can we do things differently? And so how can we get into conversations uh, and that probably would include defund the police, that conversation to a place where we can offer solutions 
that really uphold uh, everyone's human dignity. Thank you. Your next question kind of con connects with that one, which is based on your experience and your, your years doing human rights work along the border, how do you explain the way in which many migrants have been treated um, that's denied their basic dignity? The story you told about Anastasio, for example. Uh, in a similar way, how would you explain the way in which Black people have been treated so horrifically by police? And uh, what gives you hope that that could change? Yeah, so, um, so yesterday we uh, were part of a network of organizations that held um, uh, a binational uh, protest. Uh, one was in the San Isidro around the Pet West uh, uh, crossing and the other was in Tijuana. They had more of a march, ours was more stationary. And we did this in a way that respected uh, COVID protocols, maintaining a distance and wearing face masks and, and all of that. Um, and we were calling attention to the fact that now the United States essentially has decimated the asylum process. Um, and, uh, and that goes to your question, you know, how do we explain that? I, I think um, on one level, uh, it gets to a point where you can dehumanize a group of people so much to the extent that it's easier to um, trample upon their rights because you no longer see them as a reflection of yourself. And oftentimes this is similarly what happens with, um, with police departments um, uh, because uh, certain communities are criminalized and dehumanized to a certain extent where it's easier to implement policies that violate or trample upon their uh, basic human rights. Um, so that's a very, you know, kind of easy um, uh, answer. I know it's much deeper than that, but I think it gets to the root of the problem of, of dehumanization. And we certainly, and, and I can certainly speak more to that around uh, migration issues. Um, if you look at the words that Border Patrol used to describe migrants, they're horrendous. They, they are completely dehumanized. I mean, they will use the word tonk to, to um, address the person because tonk is the sound that a baton makes when it hits someone. And so they say, how many tonks do you have? Um, and so this, this is language, just the, the codified language of calling someone an illegal alien um, is uh, already dehumanizing. And this is codified into law. Um, and it's taken a long time to even get um, newspaper, um, the media to change the language that they use. Um, and the UT now, for instance, locally has a survey that they're putting out about what problematic language they might be using. And they're asking people to respond to that. And, and so whenever someone addresses someone and calls them a, an illegal alien, um, it's not only disparaging, but it also it's, uh, has a practice of dehumanizing them. And so it's easier then to implement policies that don't recognize them as, as human beings. And any reflections on strategies or aspirations for reversing that process? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, there's a lot of uh, hope for me in what I see in the recent uh, BLM uh, protests. Um, there's a lot of real solidarity that I'm seeing, especially from young people. Uh, young people who um, haven't yet had <laughs> the opportunity to be, um, I think, uh, to be so in battle that, 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 you know, not, I'm not speaking as a young person because I'm not a young person <laughs> anymore. But, uh, you know, sometimes our, our vision for change gets a little muddled. And, and I think uh, where the hope lies for me is how young people are able to learn from uh, some of the elders and the experiences that the elders have had in their communities to offer a fresh and new perspective. And so in these BLM protests that have been popping up everywhere, where they're organized by um, teenagers from a local high school club are quite impressive because they are uh, really putting out um, a vision for what they would like to see in their society. And so, uh, and oftentimes that involves uh, for using a, uh, you know, using a word that has been overused, I think a, a really intersectional approach at wanting to uh, protect everyone, being inclusive about that protection. Uh, and that's been very inspiring for me lately. Thank you. Next question is, you know, as you mentioned, uh, Pedro, that issues related to the border, migrants, refugees, asylum seekers are perennial. They come and go, ebb and flow based on what else is happening in the world. 
but the, the, the questions and the challenges are always severe and very difficult. So what, what has allowed you to stay with those difficulties, to stay connected to the, the struggle for the number of years that you have? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I see a lot of resilience in people, um, people that are suffering in ways that I had never have, uh, that, that have to make ends meet um, and are struggling to put food on the table. And, and that resiliency really um, is, in, is really uh, powerful to witness um, because uh, in spite of the challenges that an individual might have, in spite of um, the circumstances that they're living, they're able yet to uh, live another day and, and offer hope for themselves, for their family members, for others in their communities. And, and this uh, becomes really, um, really powerful when people suddenly become aware that they're not alone. And so when we've been able to take community members to, to DC, for instance, to meet with their members of Congress or to um, Sacramento to meet with their legislators there, or even to convenings where people from different communities come together you know, this recognition that, wow, you know, you've experienced the same thing and I've experienced something similar. So suddenly, you know, it's, it's not, I'm not an isolated case, but there is a uh, sort of this um, mutual uh, collective experience um, that, that is expressed in, in the tears and the um, being able to share their stories that, that builds uh, the strength and the leadership that they've always had. Um, and so I think, uh, you know, to theorize that a little bit more, it, you know, it's sort of like the um, people recognizing their own agency and, uh, and being capable of becoming social actors and in effect then uh, changing the policies that are afflicting them and their communities. And, and that transition is, is quite powerful. Um, and I've seen it over and over and, and I think, um, and, and that also, going back to the prior question, that also gives me hope because it's, um, if they're able to do it, um, despite the overwhelming circumstances that they are dealing with, um, then, then we are able to offer a different vision for how society could be structured. And one, again, that's, that's uh, much more open and, and that's much more inclusive of, of everyone's presence. Thank you. I have one or two more questions here, but have you received any from people? And... Um, let's see. Uh, no, just a, a comment, but uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. So the question I have here uh, came in. I understand that there are regulations about how far into the country CBP agents are authorized to, to work, but it seems like that's been changing or it's been ignored. Do you know what the, the laws or the statutes on that are? Yeah, so the, the Border Patrol and, and CBP can operate within 100 air miles of any, uh, any border. And so that encompasses a very large swath of, of land that encircles the uh, United States. And so that usually includes most of the largest cities in the country. It includes most of the population in the country. If we consider, for instance, LA is within 100 air miles of the, the sea border. Um, and, and so if we were to look at it that way, it's a large swath of land. So 100 air miles, and then there's another uh, threshold, which is 25 miles. And that 25 miles allows them to, in, to enter into uh, private property, not into a domicile, not into a home, but into private property. And so there's these various uh, thresholds that oftentimes uh, are, um, are not necessarily respected. So in, in considering but they're not, um, how should I say, they are uh, they're, they're regulations, but they, they are not necessarily always adhered to. So it's often, for instance, a case in New Mexico where we hear about Border Patrol checkpoints being beyond that 100 mile threshold. Um, and, and so that's something that we might see regularly. And they might make the argument that there is a, uh, a need for that checkpoint to be there because of certain type of uh, traffic that they've noticed at that location. When, whenever they have these roving patrols around the 76 or the 78 corridor, it's because they say it's a known uh, trafficking uh, node and they have to have uh, agents in that, those locations. However, uh, going back now to the question about their expanding jurisdiction, um, so when uh, the news came out that they were in Portland, for instance, um, 
it was uh, mandated or, or um, how should I say, it, it was, uh, the, the order was through uh, the, executive, um, the executive order to protect monuments and federal buildings, federal structures. So then that gave those federal agents a new special jurisdiction to operate within those areas. And there were those very uh, problematic videos that were that surface of agents detaining people without identifying themselves. And, and, and that's what I meant going back to the initial uh, start of my conversation that the problematic nature of how border agencies have operated with impunity where they're not held accountable for their actions is a slippery slope if in fact um, how Border Patrol has this intention of becoming much more of a national municipal police force, if they carry with them um, those tendencies of not being held accountable for their actions. So um, I think um, implied in the question is what are some of the problematic aspects of, ex of an expanding border agency that now has jurisdiction throughout the country. And so I think those are it related to increasing surveillance, increasing um, problematic ways of how they, they do their business, uh, the fact that they're an opaque agency. And this is something that the head of um, uh, Civil Rights and Civil Liberties, uh, which is a part of, it's an investigative arm of the Department of Homeland Security, told me a few years ago that at best, the Border Patrol is an opaque agency. Um, and so we, that's something that we have come to, uh, to see in many different ways um, in terms of how they operate, try to cover up uh, investigative uh, uh, cases, uh, most recently trying to uh, erase uh, records that are over four years uh, old, for instance, in terms of uh, cases involving uh, alleged abusive uh, practices. Thank you. Uh, the last question I have here, and then if others have, or if you have there, Pedro, but just uh, the question is, earlier this week, there was an article in the New York Times about misinformation efforts aimed at uh, Latino communities, Latinx communities, uh, related to trying to sow division between them and, and Black communities. Do you have any uh, reflections on that? Have you seen that? And any ideas about how to spread correct information in Latinx communities? I, I did not see that article um, and I'm not aware of the specifics of the article. I, I think, um, you know, in, in, um, in movement work, and this is how I would say that it's movement work when you're working for social justice, um, oftentimes there, there, there might be a tendency by some individuals to get into the practice of, of what someone has called the, uh, you know, the oppression Olympics. And so if uh, my community is more oppressed and so I'm more deserving of X, Y, and Z, no, you're wrong, my community is more oppressed. And so I think um, there might be some tendency in that within certain uh, elements of movement work, but for the most part, um, what I tend to see is that there, there really um, uh, is an effort to strive for um, working together and for supporting each other. And I think that's something that's been crucial with the Black Lives Movement, um, what it has done in really uplifting um, everyone's challenges and letting people speak from their own lived experience and from their own reality. And that's something that I really appreciate from, um, from what I've seen in protests and in different activities. And, and it's definitely uh, something that probably has been missed in, in uh, maybe years ago in some of the movement work, but it's much more present nowadays. Um, and, and I really um, think that that represents um, a greater maturity of uh, people involved in social justice work. Thank you. you know, I just had another question come in and it seems quite relevant. So uh, maybe I'll just read it. You know, This person uh, recently read the book, American Dirt. And that helped me empathize with the person who makes a decision to come to the US. Mm -hmm. How do we as a church community build a cohesive support mechanism for those efforts, Black Lives Matter more generally? Yeah, and, and, um, and I should say that American Dirt does have its, its own set of controversies. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm gonna take a moment just to plug my uh, computer. Uh, okay. it seems, um, my battery's low, give me a second. Yeah. 
apologize for that. Um, if so, yeah. So American Dirt has its own um, kind of interesting history, and and uh, and I should be um, forthright and say that I uh, I know the author, and and um, the author consulted me on different aspects of of the story as in the very beginning stages as uh, she was contemplating writing about the subject matter. Um, but nonetheless, I think the, it points to um, the bigger question is how do we empathize? How do we get to learn more about stories? Um, and I certainly always, it's, it's like when I'm leading uh, border tours, uh, groups of students that will, I will take to the border, uh, to different areas of the border and, and we talk about different aspects and it's always about, um, you know, don't, don't take what I say as absolute truth. Uh, don't take what the Border Patrol agent might tell you as absolute truth, but um, become, become a, um, a source of different, uh, or, a, or a receptor of different sources and develop your own analysis. And I think um, um, stories like what American Dirt uh, shares uh, are a good way of trying to um, understand uh, on a much more intimate, way uh, what people go through, uh, what they experience. And, and there's a, a growing body of literature around um, uh, these sorts of stories. And, and I think that's a, a good introduction of what might take place, but then of what, how, how to understand the subject matter, but even going beyond that, um, get to know what some of the organizations are in your immediate community and what work they're doing and find ways of supporting them. Not, a, not in a way where you get in the way of the work, but that you are, um, but that you're really contributing to what their goals might be of those organizations. And so I, I, I that's how I would answer that that question, Michael. Okay. Thank you, Pedro. I have, I do have a couple of questions here. Okay. Um, so one of them is, uh, is there any movements of which you know that would allow peaceful protests without the threat of military style armed enforcement? Covered in the background in some areas of the country. Um, I don't know. You know, it's. I, I think. Um, you know, I think over the past couple of years, there's been uh, growing uh, concern for the militarization of police and police forces. Um, and so, if we look at how the police has evolved over decades and the sort of armament that they that they use and. You know, we, we know about the prison industrial complex, but there's also a security industrial complex. There are groups that will meet every year, um, have these large conventions um, where these um, multinational corporations arrive and they're selling the product, which are weapons and arms. Um, and oftentimes uh, these corporations are, are stateless in, in effect in terms of operating different nation states without really being held accountable to the product that they're selling. Um, the, the, the type of surveillance that is uh, taking place now, there's an article yesterday about how Google is uh, beginning to sell um, artificial intelligence to CBP and how that's going to be used for border monitoring is very concerning because uh, the reason I think it's concerning uh, apart from the surveillance aspect, um, but because it, it's that's much more of an acceptable way of um, of monitoring bo the border without the the presence uh, of armed agents. On the other hand, though, I think it raises concerns about um, uh, civil possible civil rights violations. I'm not saying I accept that. I'm just saying that for uh, sort of the liberal crowd politicians, they might say, "Well, look, we'll turn to artificial intelligence instead of having the armed agent at every." Uh, 10 feet, for instance. Uh, we already have uh, 20,000 Border Patrol agents and another 40,000 CBP agents. Um, and so if you add that, uh, the surveillance aspect, that really raises a lot of concern about the direction of, of this security um, industrial complex and how it even seeps into uh, local police movement. So can you have a, a, a nonviolent peaceful protest without the threat of military South armed enforcement. Uh, you know, I, I wish we could move in that direction. I think uh, we're it's we're in a, a state of a slippery slope where it's actually getting um, much worse, and we'll probably see uh, many more law enforcement agents that are clad in this type of military gear versus not uh, seeing them in that way. 
Um, a second question I have here is about caging children. Is it still being practiced presently? Um, it, it is, unfortunately. Um, if you, you know, talk to uh, advocates that are working with uh, asylum seekers along the border, primarily on the Mexican side, they will tell you that, in fact, it is uh, probably not to the extent that it was happening, especially under the zero tolerance policy, but it is when you consider that uh, CBP, Customs and Border Protection, still has the authority to determine whether an adult with a child is the adult that should be with that child. And so there might be moments where um, that adult and that child might be separated. Um, I, I should say that the first case that we dealt with here of, of this type of separation took place during the uh, Obama years. Uh, it's, so it's not a practice that is exclusive to the Trump era. However, it was certainly exacerbated and expanded uh, through uh, the Trump years, uh, precisely as a political measure to try to dissuade migrants from arriving at the border, but also to sort of uh, suggest that something was being done about migration. And, and then going back to an earlier question that you had, Michael, about the, um, that I answered about the dehumanizing of, of, of certain people, um, you know, could we imagine white children being separated in, in, this, in this way, in this practice. And so it goes back to the large overarching theme of, of how um, white supremacy finds its way in these uh, practices of policy where um, it's fine to do it to a certain group of people uh, because they're seen as expendable, they're seen as uh, people who are deserving of certain treatment and not being seen as fully human. Thank you, Pedro. So we're getting close to the uh, the end of our time and really appreciate all the time you've shared with us. Before we wrap up, do you have any closing remarks or reflections you'd want to share with our group today? Yeah, I mean, I really believe that we are in a, in a crossroads and, um, and especially around questioning white supremacy as a structure of power. Um, I remember, you know, 20 years ago talking about white supremacy and it seemed to be then regarded as an outlandish way of describing how um, structures operate, how institutions operate. And now that it's being called into question in a much more acceptable setting, um, for me, the, the, um, how we lead to transformative change, I think will be um, what are some possible solutions at addressing it that really uphold uh, everyone, but um, also try to um, address uh, those his historic harms and that trauma that has been uh, that has been done. So, for instance, um, having that that lens of questioning white supremacy will allow us to say, "Hey, the construction of the border wall on indigenous land is an extension of that white supremacy." Why? Because X, Y, and Z, right? It's who are the people that are being impacted? Have they been consulted? Most likely not. Um, how are their communities disproportionately impacted by that? So, these are all questions that could be framed within this white supremacist paradigm and, and uh, interrogating um, white supremacy as, as part of the structure of power that impacts um, our everyday life. Um, and so, uh, and, and, and that's just one structure of power. There's so, you know, there's, there's patriarchy there, you know, that's also another structure of power that has yet to, uh, beyond the, uh, the Me Too movement, it's yet to really be discussing the structure of power of patriarchy as something that impacts the lives, uh, disproportionately um, impact a certain population of, of, our, of our world. Um, and there are other structures of power as well. So uh, I am very um, appreciative of this conversation. I, I think it's, uh, it's so important that we uh, engage in, in talking about um, these issues that are so uh, present in our lives and that affect people in many different ways. And so I, I thank you, Michael. And, and Jeff and everyone else at USD that made this conversation possible and everyone who attended as well. Thank you, Pedro. I wanna join Michael in thanking Pedro for a very interesting talk on a very important topic. And we continue to work in this area. This brings to an end our series on uh, white supremacy and racism. All six talks are available if you'd like to see a recording. They're available on the University of San Diego Campus Ministry YouTube site. So please feel free to check those out.
As we go forward, please continue to check on the activities of the Center for Catholic Thought and Culture. You can find our webpage at sandiego.edu backslash cctc. And our next major gathering will be on November 16th when we are having what is called the Future of Faith series in which we will be looking at the role of women in the church. So thanks again to Pedro. Thank you, Michael, for your co-sponsorship. And thanks to all of you for your participation and your support of this series. Thank you very much. Hope to see you in person at some point in the future. Thank you. Take care.